I asked you a question last week. Why is God killing me? And we saw where Paul said God was killing me so he could show me a resurrection. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, God was killing him because it's hard to see a resurrection unless something is dying. God was killing him. God was taking him through a death-like experience to raise him up. The Bible even says about Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The joy that was set before him was the anticipation of the resurrection. He could handle Friday because he knew Sunday was coming. Your ability to handle the Fridays in your life. Anybody, anybody going through a Friday? That's when you hang in there and you, circumstances are crucifying you. We call it Good Friday, but it's Bad Friday. It's circumstances are just doing you in. And you want to throw in the towel because you're dying. You are dying. But he endured it. He didn't come down from the cross in anticipation of Sunday. And what I want to give you through these vignettes I'm sharing with you is a different anticipation. Or as I've said before, if all you see is what you see, you do not see all that there is to be seen. If all you see is what you see, then you do not see all that there is to be seen. If you're just looking at how bad it is, I am not at all suggesting that you skip that. That's not real. If you're hurting, you're hurting. If you're sad, you're sad. If you're depressed, you're depressed. If you're, you know, frustrated, you're frustrated. If you're angry, you're angry. In fact, God has God gives you permission to tell him how you feel. Don't be going to God all happy acting when he know you're lying. You know, you're, you're fried, you're, you're disappointed. I want to go back to an old story. You know it well in Mark chapter 4. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go to the other side. Jesus saying to the disciples, leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat just as he was and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking out over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Why are you killing me? We're dying out here. We're perishing. It's dying. Jesus said, let's go to the other side, guys. They get in the boat. And it says, a fierce gale arose. The Greek word there is pronounced lilac. Lilac. A lilac is a basically a windstorm that whips up the Sea of Galilee out of nowhere turning a calm situation into a chaotic one. Lilacs, or these fierce gales, would just show up. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is kind of in a basin surrounded by mountains. And so when the, when the air kind of got sucked down into that, it would create sort of like a, a tornado kind of effect on the water. And it would just, just, just create havoc, unexpected, but tumultuous. Life sometimes is like that. Out of nowhere, your world is shattered. Out of nowhere, your heart is broken. Out of nowhere, your hopes are dashed. And it's killing you. It's killing you. Now, they're only in the boat because Jesus said, get in the boat. That's the only reason they're in the boat. So they are in the boat doing what God told them to do. And right smack dab in the middle of God's will, all hell breaks loose. 
We're not talking about unbelievers. We're not talking about pagans. We're not talking about uh, rebellious. We're talking about followers of the true and living God doing exactly what they were told to do, exactly how they were told to do it, and their world is now in chaos. So they've got a stormy situation. And Jesus is asleep. Jesus is asleep. Now I could handle it better if he was at least up. Because then, then I would at least feel like he's aware of my situation. I feel like he going through it, at least he going through it with me. But he's asleep. In the stern on a cushion. Just to help you about the stern of, of uh, fishing boats back then, and you can still see it in some of the foreign boats today, in the stern of the boat would be a little overhang with a little cavern underneath it where they would hold some equipment and you could crawl up under there. It was the only covered part of a fishing boat. You could kind of crawl up under there and kind of uh, uh, squeeze up and, and get a little place to lay down. And it says on a cushion. Why does he want you to know this? Why did he just say Jesus was asleep? He doesn't tell you Jesus was asleep. He says Jesus was asleep in the stern. So he wants you to know where he was asleep. And then he wants to know, he wants you to know how he was asleep on a cushion. If you're in the stern, this little compartment, and your head is on a cushion, that's a pillow. That meant you sleeping on purpose. This is planned snoozing. This is snoring because that's what you plan to do. So what I want you to know right now is that Jesus didn't just fall asleep because he was tired. He fell asleep on purpose. You'll see that in a moment. These gentlemen have a number of problems in this story. Problem number one, a storm on the outside. But problem number one created problem number two, a storm on the inside. They're scared because they're perishing. Now you would wonder how Jesus could sleep through this kind of storm that made it look like they were going to die. That means... And these are professional fishermen on this boat. So these are not novices or folk who've never been in the water before. These are professional fishermen. So they're used to this. So this had to be a real bad situation for them to raise the question, do you not care? So they got a problem on the outside, a storm. They've got storm raging on the inside. In other words, their circumstances out there was creating a mess in here. Because they're terrified. But then they got a theological storm. You don't care. Because if you cared, one, we, we shouldn't be going through this. And if you really cared, you'd at least be up. You'd at least be awake. You'd at least be aware. You'd at least be here with us. Don't you care? And if the truth be told, when God is letting us go through a lilac, it doesn't feel like he cares. And he sure enough seems to be asleep because he seems unaware of what we're going through and why he's letting us go through it. They were going through it. They were in deep confusion. Teacher, verse 38, do you not care that we are perishing? We're dying in this thing. This is killing me. Verse 39. And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. 
So Jesus is talking to the circumstances. It says he rebuked the wind. He told the wind what to do and he told the sea, quiet up. So he's not talking to people now, he's talking to situations. Not talking to living objects in that sense. He's telling circumstances to change. Wind stop blowing and sea stop bouncing. And he said to them, why are you afraid? How is it you have no faith? About 125 times we're told in the New Testament about lack of faith or to take carriage or why do you have so little faith or phrases like that. About 125 times. But at face value, it seemed like an unfair question because they just told you why they were scared. Hello, Jesus, we're dying. So we're a little scared. We're dying here. That question would be like asking somebody who just got out of a swimming pool, why are you wet? I mean, it's on face value. Yet Jesus poses the question as though they should not have been afraid. When it seems an unfair question, given the circumstances. Dying, I'm dying. Why should I not be afraid? He goes on to say, how is it that you have no faith? So, the increase of the fear was tied to the decrease of the faith. In other words, faith and fear can't occupy the same space at the same time. Fear is a reflection, fear in this use of the word fear, the, the illegitimate use of fear, of the fact that faith has has been interrupted, faith has been eclipsed, faith has decreased. Sometimes he talks about little faith. Here he says you have no faith. Im implication is you should have faith. The question is, why should they have had faith? Why? Get, especially given the circumstances they're dying. If, if, you read, if you read things that happened prior to this, this is, this is found in Mark 4, it's also found in Matthew 8, this story you will find they have seen Jesus at work. See, they have seen what he can do for others. They have seen his miraculous hand. They have seen the testimony of his word. They have seen him heal. They have seen him, they, they know that this Jesus is not ordinary, it's, he's extraordinary. But just like us, It's easy to forget what D Jesus did yesterday when I'm in a lilac today. It's easy to forget, you know, when I was going through ABC a month ago, God came out of nowhere and took care of that thing. But that's back then. I'm in a mess right now. I got a lilac. I got a... I got a tumultuous situation on my hands. But there's another reason why he condemns their fear. And that reason is back in verse 35. On that day, when evening came, he said to them, let us go to the other side. Translation, gentlemen, get in the boat. Guess where we're going? All the way over to the other side. Guess what their circumstances did? Their circumstances caused them to forget what he said. 
He said, we're going to make it to the other side. He told them before they hit the circumstance, they're going to make it. He told them that. But in the middle of the circumstance, it looked like it contradicted what he said because they're not going to make it. They said, we're perishing. So watch this now. So the circumstance overrode the word. You with me? What they could see overrode the fulfillment of a word they could not see. They, we couldn't see the other side because the circumstance said we're not going to get there. Circumstance said we're not going to make it. Circumstance said we're going to drown right out here in the middle of nowhere. We're going to die. What will always breed fear when you're dying, perishing in the circumstance you're in, is forgetting what God said he was going to do. Because the circumstances and the ways are so big and so looming. You say, wow. Wow, this is not, this is not, I ain't going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Why are you so afraid? They probably, amen, discernment. They probably said, oh, other side, other side. Yeah, we're going to make it to the other side. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God for the other side, other side. Hallelujah for the other side. <laughs> other side, other side, other side. <laughs> they had it going. They just, they because there was no lilac. When there is no lilac, then God's word sweet, rich, full. Complete, inerrant, without error. But in the middle, when there's a lilac, and you can't remember that word because the circumstances are looming too large. Another cue they should have gotten was from the posture of Jesus. He's asleep. He is sound asleep. He is calm in the middle of the storm. But he is calm in the same storm that's shaking you up. Well, he wasn't in a different place. He was in the same storm and went to sleep on purpose. You see, what they should have said in our more spiritual moments, you know, when we just really got it going on with God. Now, Jesus said, we're going to make it. And he said, we're going to make it all the way over. And he must have meant it because he sleep <laughs> on a pillar in the stern, which means he sleep on purpose. So maybe we all need to lay down. The biblical word for that is resting in the midst of the storm. Okay, now watch this, watch this. I love, I love verse 41. Then they became very much afraid and said, who then is this? Some version says, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. They said, we are very much afraid. Now, a few minutes ago, they were afraid. Their circumstances was dictating their emotion. Now they are very afraid. A few minutes ago, they were afraid of their circumstances. But when Jesus Christ showed who he was, they became of the one they should have been afraid of all the time. See, they were fearing the wrong thing. They had so much focus on their circumstances that their circumstances overruled God. That's being afraid of the wrong thing. Now they're saying, what manner of man is this? That the circumstances respond to him. See, what we do is we respond to the circumstances and then they control our emotions. When what they said was, now we're going to respond to him because he controls the circumstances. So why is God killing me? Why is he putting me in this perishing situation? So that you'll learn to fear him more 
than the thing you're fearing right now. So that you'll learn to fear him more than the thing you're fearing right now. So what is that thing that's causing you to lose your grip, causing you to lose your hope, causing you to lose your joy, and you think there is no solution to this? I'm stuck. I'm I'm no way out. I am dying. And God is sleeping on purpose because he wants to let you see that he's true to his word even when the circumstances contradict it. And when he's ready to speak to the circumstances, they will obey. 